Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Amanda Lewis, and I think we're going to get started soon because it'll take me a few minutes to get through my welcoming remarks and, uh, and uh, introduce all our panelists. Um, we are thrilled to have you all here tonight um, for this panel, which we had originally scheduled to be in person, um, I believe, in March of 2020, um, and have finally um, decided to just go ahead and, and, and do it virtually. Um, as I said, my name is Amanda Lewis. I'm the director of the Institute for Research on Race and Public Policy here at UIC. Um, and the Institute has as our mission to increase society's understandings of the root causes of racial and ethnic inequality and to provide the public, organizers, practitioners, and policymakers with research based policy solutions. To fulfill that mission, IRPP funds research on race and ethnicity, trains scholars to participate in policy discussions collaborates on social justice projects with community organizers and holds events such as this one, exploring the link between uh, policy and racial and ethnic injustice. Um, we are um, thrilled to be bringing together an amazing group of people to talk about the important work they've been doing in Chicago for quite a while. Um, as you can see, the title of this panel is Data for Justice? Question mark, Transforming Chicago's Criminal Legal System. And we're going to be really exploring the way that um, a wide array of people have begun to use data in lots of new ways to challenge criminal justice policy, to um, fight for changes, um, to show patterns of differential practice across community, and to raise important questions about the way data is being used um, by law enforcement. Um, tonight, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists. Um, who will each in turn offer their comments and insights um, and then turn things over to our fabulous moderator who will facilitate a conversation and the Q&A. Um, and please, um, as we're going along, if you have any questions, put them into the Q&A function um, in Zoom. And then we will, um, you don't have to wait till the end, we'll draw on those um, as we're having conversation at the end. Um, but I will introduce all of the panelists now and then turn it over to um, Dr. Andy Klarna, who's going to be the one to get us started. So Andy Klarna is an associate professor of sociology and black studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. His research um, and activism is on racism, capitalism, colonialism, and empire in the 21st century, with a focus on racialized policing and struggles for social justice in contexts of extreme inequality. He coordinates the Policing in Chicago Research Project, a team of faculty and graduate students at UIC providing research support to social movements confronting racialized policing from local law enforcement, federal immigration authorities, and national security agendas. The group also facilitates participatory action research projects by young people directly um, impacted by policing. Um, he was going to be presenting with Janae Bonsu, one of his colleagues. Um, Janae is an activist researcher and licensed master social worker committed to Black women, trans, and non-binary people through research, policy, and practice. She found a passion in providing strategic research support for grassroots campaigns concerned with gendered and racialized policing. Janae completed a PhD in social work at the University of Illinois Chicago, an MA from the Crown Family School of Social Work, Policy and Practice, and a BA in Experimental Psychology and Criminal Justice from the University of South Carolina. She currently works as a senior research associate at the National Black Women's Justice Institute and is a longtime member of Black Youth Project 100, BYP 100. Um, when they're done, then we will hear next from um, Jamie Calvin, who is a writer and human rights activist at the Invisible Institute, whose work has appeared in a wide variety of publications. In recent years, he has reported extensively on patterns of police abuse and impunity in Chicago, but he has also been active in public housing development activism and writing. Among his many accomplishments has been that his extensive work on police reform was instrumental in establishing a legal precedent that documents bearing on allegations of police misconduct or public information. Um, next, we'll hear from Joe Ferguson, who just finished his third term as Chicago's Inspector General, where he grew the office into one of the nation's leading municipal oversight agencies, with much, with much of that work focused on public safety. He was named to the Police Accountability Task Force, which developed pragmatic and transparent recommendations for police reform. This work resulted in duly empowered Independent Civilian Investigative Police Oversight Agency, the Civilian Office of Police Accountability, and a dedicated police inspector general. Ferguson is a lecturer at Loyola University Chicago School of Law, as well as the co-director of its National Security and Civil Rights Program. Then we will hear from Matthew Saini, 
who joined the Cook County State's Attorney's Office in 2017 as its first ever chief, chief data officer. At the State's Attorney's Office, he leads a team responsible for their ongoing work to advance prosecutorial transparency and innovation in criminal justice. In 2018, the Cook County State's Attorney's Office became the first prosecutor's office to make case level data um, open and available to the public. And they have been working since then on providing the public with resources on how to think about, understand, and work with this data. And finally, I want to interview, um, introduce the, um, my brilliant colleague who will be our moderator, Stacy Sutton. She's an associate professor in the Department of Urban Planning and Policy, the director of Applied Research and Strategic Partnerships at UIC's Social Justice Initiative, and faculty fellow at the Institute for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing at Rutgers University. Her scholarship, te teaching, and activism focused on racial and economic justice, specifically economic democracy, worker-owned cooperatives, collective action, and the solidarity economy. Stacy also uses publicly available data to analyze racially disparate effects of place-based city policies and the construction of punitive cities. Um, thank you so much, and I happily am going to turn things over now to Andy Klano. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, and thanks, Yvonne and Dina, for organizing this panel. I'm excited to be here and in conversation uh, with so many great panelists. And I actually want to start by, by thanking Joe Ferguson for the incredible service you provided uh, as Inspector General. As you'll see in this presentation, some of the, the research that we've done is really drawn on uh, publications and reports put out by, by the Inspector General's office. So uh, wishing you the best moving forward. The, the Chicago Police Department is, is on the cutting edge of global trends toward the use of large databases, predictive analytics, and advanced surveillance technology. The CPD has also earned praise for its efforts to share data with state and federal law enforcement agencies. But these police databases are grounded in racialized discourses about crime, terror, and belonging. They codify the devaluation of Black, Latinx, and Arab and Muslim life by treating labels like the gang member, the illegal alien, and the suspected terrorist as objective truths and then facilitating the circulation of this information across webs of criminalizing surveillance. For the last four years, Janae Bonsu and I, along with the rest of the Policing and Chicago Research Group, have worked with social movements and transformative justice organizations to document the criminalizing impacts of big data policing on communities of color in Chicago. The Policing in Chicago Research Group is an activist research collective composed of faculty and grad students at UIC. We produce research in support of campaigns by organizations on the front lines of struggles against police repression. Through a partnership with BYP 100 and organized communities against deportation, we've looked into gang databases as tools used by the CPD and ICE as pipelines to prison and deportation. And in collaboration with the Arab American Action Network, we've examined the role of fusion centers and suspicious activity reports as mechanisms for the surveillance and criminalization of Arab and Muslim communities by the CPD and the FBI. Chicago is, is arguably the most heavily surveilled city in the country. Police and federal agencies have access to over 35,000 surveillance cameras, some estimates say up to 50,000, along with shot spotter auto detection, audio detection devices, automatic license plate readers, stingray cell site stimulator, simulator devices, social media monitoring software, and other technologies. Much of this data flows into the CPD central database called CLEAR, the Citizen and Law Enforcement Analysis and Reporting System. Since 2003, the CPD has used CLEAR to identify people and places for heightened surveillance and more aggressive policing. In 2007, the CPD bought, built a high-tech surveillance center at the department headquarters, which is known as CPIC, the Crime Prevention and Information Center, to monitor, which is, is the central hub for monitoring surveillance equipment and processing its data. And in a more present, in, in a really unprecedented move, in the last four years, the CPD has multiplied and decentralized its surveillance capacity by adding 28 new high-tech surveillance centers at police stations across the country, across the city. Advances in, in technology ensure that police surveillance is extremely expansive, meaning that it grows quickly and includes large numbers of people. But it remains highly focused, meaning that it disproportionately targets people on the basis of race and class. In 2019, 
The public safety team in Joe Ferguson's office released a report demonstrating that there are more than 134,000 adults on the CPD's gang arrest card database. That shows the expansiveness of this system. But 95% of the people on the database are people of color, 70% Black and 25% Latinx. Similarly, suspicious activity reports are generated whenever someone reports something that they consider suspicious to the police through the, if you see something, say something program. 77% of people whose racial identity is listed on the CPD's SAR database are people of color. 54% are identified as Arab, Muslim, Middle Eastern, or quote, olive skinned. Police databases codify these dehumanizing archetypes such as gang member, illegal alien, and suspected terrorist by transforming them into so-called facts and storing them in a person's permanent record. This produces a facade of scientific objectivity that allows the police to disavow the racial basis of policing. But data-driven policing creates a vicious cycle. Aggressive patrols in black and brown neighborhoods produce data that then becomes supposedly objective proof that police should continue targeting the same neighborhoods and the same populations. Moreover, mechanisms for data sharing enable the rapid circulation of data between law enforcement agencies, which facilitates coordination and generates these webs of criminalizing surveillance that crisscross the country. After 2001, the federal government created a national network of what are known as fusion centers to coordinate data sharing or data fusion between local, state, federal, and tribal agencies. The CPD's central high-tech surveillance hub, CPIC, is a fusion center, which means it is staffed not only by the local police, but by the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the DEA, and the ATF. They're all in the same room together. And they're tasked with ensuring the constant flow of data between local, state, and federal agencies. In addition, the Chicago Police Department provides over 500 agencies with access to its clear data system. Federal agencies use this data to target people classified by CPD as gang members and suspected terrorists. For instance, the Inspector General's public safety team revealed that ICE and other immigration authorities searched the CPD gang database over 32,000 times from 2009 to 2018 to identify alleged gang members as priority targets for deportation. Overall then, our research demonstrates and documents the criminalizing impact of big data policing. But Black, Latinx, and Arab and Muslim communities in Chicago are refusing to be labeled criminal, alien, or terrorist. Instead of just seeking restitution for individuals who have been wrongly, wrongfully accused of gang membership or terrorist activity, abolitionist movements are demanding the abolition of gang databases and suspicious activity reports, calling for an end to interagency data sharing demanding restitution for people harmed by the practices and divestment from the surveillance state and a broader investment in communities. And Janae, Janae is now gonna speak about the role of data in movements that are helping us move towards abolition and to envision solutions that affirm the full humanity for communities of color in Chicago and beyond. Thanks everybody. Thanks Andy. Uh, good evening everyone. So again, I'm Janae Bonsu and I want to hone in on a sliver of what Andy discussed, uh, which is a campaign that I primarily worked on as both a member of the Policing in Chicago Research Group uh, and as an organizer in BYP 100 at the time, in order to really highlight the way that data and reports have been used in movement building in Chicago. Um, because exposure was one of the main goals of the research partnership between the PCRG and movements that shaped the strategy of uh, the campaign to erase the Chicago gang database or to end the gang database. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Um, so back in 2017, top of 2017, Q1, I think Trump inauguration, um, grassroots organizations joined forces to defund CPD um, before it was being talked about on CNN, uh, dismantle ICE or the Immigration and Customs Enforce Enforcement and invest in our communities. Uh, and these organizations led and continue to lead a campaign in Chicago that identified the CPD gang database as a racist tool that criminalizes black and brown communities and creates a pipeline to both incarceration and deportation. So the campaign to erase the Chicago gang database really emerged from 
a history of Black-led organizing against police violence and criminalization in Chicago on one hand, and from a history of Chicago's anti-deportation and immigrants' rights movements on the other hand. So this campaign really brought together efforts to resist criminalization and eliminate uh, exceptions in Chicago's sanctuary city policy, otherwise known as the welcoming city ordinance, as well as uh, to, to free uh, Wilmer Catalan Ramirez from detention, who's a member of the organized, uh, organized communities against deportations. So over time, the erase the base, uh, erase the database campaign, excuse me, grew from kind of three anchor organizations, uh, BYP 100, Academy, Hente, on to, become an expansive coalition of grassroots legal labor and research groups like the Policing Chicago Research Group. Um, so we created a campaign to expose the hidden operations of big data policing. We wanted to mobilize communities directly impacted by the gang database, advocate for abolition and seek restitution for the harmful effects of the database. And so we saw tackling the gang database as just one way to tackle or attack the system of racialized surveillance, criminalization, incarceration, and deportation that disproportionately impacted Black and Brown communities. Um, we saw this campaign as a unifying effort that would make it kind of harder for the state to play us against each other, us being Black and Brown, US born and immigrant, um, you know, which can be strategies to divide, um, divide and conquer. So the Erase the Database campaign has really kind of helped open a new front in the struggle for um, what has been termed abolitionist sanctuary, um, which essentially is both a, a strategically defensive and offensive framework um, to kind of combine the logic and practice of sanctuary, which you know, leverages community to provide safety from imminent harm, with abolition, which seeks to transform the conditions under which harm is possible, right? Um, and so these, this concept of abolitionist sanctuary is uh, made complicated by big data policing, you know, with uh, massive databases and advanced technology and the data sharing practices that, that Andy just talked about that facilitates racialized surveillance and, and coordination between local and national uh, security agencies and federal immigration authorities. So this campaign, uh, sought to attack just a, a sliver of that in Chicago with the database. And so research and story collection, data analysis, as well as visibilizing the harms and ending the database were core strategies of the campaign. So the Policing in Chicago Research Group led the research and data analysis um, and kind of followed the campaign goals to stop gang designations, expose the data and procedures and fix the harm. Um, so first things first, and just kind of setting out to learn everything that we could about databases in Chicago from interviews, FOIA requests, archival research. Um, we began to kind of reveal some of the contours of what was once a mysterious data system that no one really knew about. Um, you know, it, it was kind of sparked by an, uh, an arrest of someone who was wrongfully identified as a gang member. It kind of sparked these questions to, um, to figure out how he was identified, what was, what was the mechanisms for, um, for this tracking. And so, you know, we, we essentially learned that electronic databases were just one of the latest inter, uh, iterations of CPD's gang tracking, um, you know, in the, in the clear system that Andy mentioned earlier. We learned that it wasn't just a single standalone system like it is in say California or New York where there's just a separate database. It's you know, an amalgamation of different databases and tools for storing gang designations. Um, and that the vast majority of people in this database were black and Latinx, 95%. Um, and so while conducting this research, you know, the call for an investigation by the inspector general really marked the beginning of our second research strategy. And our first report, which was called Tracked and Targeted, we published it in 2017. And uh, in it, we recommended that the city of Chicago begin a process of inquiry independent from the CPD, because why would we have them investigate themselves, right? Um, such as the Office of the Inspector General to investigate the procedures and civil rights protections, et cetera. Um, and we had a teach-in, uh, actually it was at UIC, I believe. And uh, 
it just so happens that a staff member from the OIG was there um, and you know, making this call to action. And I remember they came up to me, it was like, hey, we heard you. And next thing you know, there's a, an announcement from the office that they're you know, going to start this evaluation or they at that time was going to start an evaluation or a review um, of, of CPD's gang databases, which really felt like an intermediate victory for the campaign at that time. Um, because you know we understood that the inspector general would have more resources and access to CPD data than the PCRG. They weren't responding to FOIA requests. It was just you know it was hard, <laughs> and, and the OIG was able to really um, get a lot of questions answered that that we were looking for. Um, so you know after finishing their investigation, we kind of got um, confirmation to some of the things we already suspected about you know, insufficient controls for generating, maintaining, and sharing gang-related data from CPD, um, lack of procedural fairness and protections, um, you know, just data quality concerns, lack of transparency, all of these things. Um, and so, you know, between the OIG investigation, um, the what we were able to find from archival research and interviews, uh, we also organized a series of FOIA workshops for people to request documents from the CPD to find out whether their names were included on the database. Um, with all of these things, they, they've been effective research strategies and provided a foundation um, for our litigation strategy, which was the class action lawsuit and our organizing and policy research or a policy work. Um, quite literally, we took PCRG reports into meetings with city council members advocating for um, you know, an ordinance that would further the campaign's goals. So in all, I really think that the value of exposing the data collection and practices of CPD and demonstrating the harms of it were critical to the success of the grassroots efforts to resist criminalization and surveillance. Um, and so just also wanna echo Andy's gratitude uh, to you, Joe Ferguson, um, and, and your tenure as uh, the Inspector General, and, um, and in, specifically in regard to, to this work, really helped us um, further our efforts to resist criminalization in Chicago. So thank you. Thank you, Janae. That was wonderful. Um, yes, yeah, so next up, we will hear from, I believe Jamie is next up. Uh, thank you. So. Um, the, the organization I'm associated with um, and helped found is the Invisible Institute. And we're dedicated to um, sort of liberating information and making it available to citizens to enhance their capacity to hold the police department and other public institutions accountable. And, you know, while we're um, engaging in a well-earned tribute to, to Joe, I should mention that some years ago when um, the public safety unit within the OIG's office was constituted, um, Joe reported to me that he had instructed his data team within the unit that um, their mission was to put the Invisible Institute out of business which I then and now took as, as high praise for our work. Um, and also that it, it sort of crystallizes our theory of change, which is civil society innovation with data driving governmental adoption and change. And I, I wanted to come back to that to that theme in terms of kind of where we are with that effort and that process currently, what the current state of play is, but a, a little bit of a little bit of backstory. So really the Invisible Institute grows out of reporting that I did 25 years ago and more um, in the last chapter of high rise public housing in Chicago. I was sort of on the ground reporting on South State Street. Um, out of, out of public housing. And I thought of the work as human rights reporting in that the orientation was on the lived experience of the people most affected by um, uh, abusive and unconstitutional policies and practices. So for several years, I wrote a number of um, 
reports, articles on individual instances of abuse by police officers operating in that, um, you know, in that space. And over time, the question formed, what set of institutional conditions would have to exist for the conditions that my colleagues and I were observing from day to day and documenting to be the case? How could these officers be um, engaging in abuse with so openly, so brazenly, with such a sense of impunity? And that question, I, I would say, you know, over now many, many years, sort of continues to, to animate our work, you know, and trying to stay in close touch with the lived experience of the people most affected and understand the sort of larger web of institutional complicity in the conditions that allow for um, the kind of abuses that, um, the racialized abuses that concern us all. I formed a partnership some 20 odd years ago with lawyers and law students at the University of Chicago Legal Aid Clinic. And we began to bring civil rights suits um, culminating with a, a 10 year battle that ultimately produced a, um, a, Amanda referenced it in the introduction, a decision of the Illinois Appellate Court, Calvin v. Chicago, in which the, um, uh, the court held that investigations of allegations of police misconduct are public information in Illinois. And you know, the reality is, is as you know, messed up as conditions are in our city and our state, we actually have achieved relative to a lot of other jurisdictions, a, um, a, a relatively high watermark of transparency. And I wanna talk a little bit about what is insufficient about that, but, but it's, you know, it, I, I think it's also important to recognize that something significant happened. And it enabled us to access through the lawsuit, through subsequent decisions that consolidated the precedent through a sort of ongoing FOIA campaign, a great deal of information that had previously been withheld from the public. And that information is now housed in the um, Citizens Police Data Project of the Invisible Institute and also um, Joe having make good, made good on his charge to his, his public safety unit in the office of the inspector general in a database maintained by the, by the inspector general. The importance of this data, which is mostly sort of high level um, um, aggregate data about police complaints is what it enables us to do in terms of the pattern analysis identifying officers with high levels of, you know, high numbers of complaints, groups of officers uh, working together who all have a sufficiently high number of complaints that it can't be explained as a statistical anomaly. Something's going on with that group of officers, particularly concerning categories of complaint, um, the uh, geographic distribution of complaints, the command structures and um, complaints under you know, particular commanders and chains of command. Um, so this has been, you know, this has been tremendously valuable. It's been used by all sorts of, of um, different, different constituencies, um, lawyers of different sorts, journalists, um, citizens community groups public defenders now, the CPDP, the database is now incorporated into the uh, case management system of the public defender's office. So public de a public defender overworked um, going into a first appearance with a client on let's say um, uh, aggravated assault of a police officer, or, you know, a charge like that, can go to their cell phone, go to CPD and check the officers um, disciplinary history. If they're if they find that there are a number of excessive force allegations, um, that may be sufficient to to sort of um, shake the officer's credibility. So there, you know, all sorts of different 
different applications. Um, it, they, they, um, I, I predicted the dogs would be barking and they've, they've joined, but the, um, um, we, we've created kind of a, by being non-proprietary and hospitable with the data, it also has created a kind of hive of researchers who um, dig into the data. Uh, we kind of loosely curate curate their work together, and it's really you know been and for me as a kind of old fashioned shoe leather reporter, um, sort of a revelation and an exciting kind of unfolding development. I want to talk now about sort of where we where we find ourselves and what the what the next frontier of transparency is. But first, I, I want to make one broad observation, which is that the you know the the moral import of this information really for me is related to what I take to be a cornerstone of human rights work which is that we have an absolute moral obligation to know what can be known about affronts to human dignity, about violations of people's right, human rights, and to, to um, act on that knowledge. And so, you know, part of what we have been demonstrating and the OIG has been demonstrating and, you know, all of us in this conversation have been working towards is showing that um, what can be learned when you connect the dots of, you know, of available information. And, and, but I think that notion of the responsibilities that come with knowledge and what's so exciting about the work that is being done with data is the possibility of expanding the knowable, expanding what can be known and the, the moral ramifications of that. So in order to sort of bring things up to date um, to, to what I believe to be really the next frontier and we're poised there in terms of transparency, one, one distinction. So what, what is housed in CPDP and the inspector general's database is, as I say, this kind of aggregate top level data about complaints. Um, date, location, the allegations, the accused officers, co-accused officers, um, some demographic information, and the ultimate disposition of the complaint. A great deal can be done with that kind of that kind of information. Notably, with the the co-accused officers, there is all sorts of interesting work being done, network analysis to show how these cohorts of cohorts of um, abusive officers form, how they infect other officers, you know, how they manage to, to cohere over time. Um, but the, the, there's a whole other category of documents and information that belongs to the public under the Calvin decision, which are the so-called CR files, CR term of art, um, complaint registers. These are the investigative files uh, generated in the course of various agencies um, investigating citizen administrative complaints. So it's the, the investigator's narrative, uh, all sorts of other um, evidence, uh, you know, notably uh, the interviews with, with various of the, of the parties. Under the Calvin decision, that is public information, but the, the, the principle is limited to the extent that the, um, the agencies can invoke the exception under uh, the Freedom of Information Act of undue burden. So, you know, basically think of it like this, that the Calvin decision gave each of us a library card that enables us to um, take a relative handful of documents out of the library, you know, of, of the CRs out of the library. And where we are now and what is, um, I think really within reach is the possibility of throwing open the doors of the library. And the consequences of that, of having 
publicly available, not just you know individuals navigating this kind of Rube Goldberg contraption of FOIA, but having the whole you know having a, a coherent repository of the underlying investigations has I think three major implications. And I should, I should say by way of preface that Joe and I worked together um, over the last either uh, OIG's office and the Invisible Institute with, with other allies, some in the, um, in the um, city council to advance through the city council an ordinance that would have really sort of realized the shared aspiration to put the Invisible Institute out of business in the sense that it would have created a, a repository in the OIG's office, really the library of these, these investigations all in one place and ever expanding. And we really came up with, I think, an elegant cost-effective way of, way of doing this, almost got it to the finish line and then were thwarted by opposition from the mayor's office in the, the sort of 11th hour. That possible, you know, we're re regrouping and thinking about how best to, to go forward. This is going to happen. This is an inevitability. We will continue to push in civil society. I think it will happen, um, you know, through the city council ultimately. But the the um, point I want to want to close with is why this is of such great importance and why it could be. Um, really a, um, a paradigm shift in what we mean by transparency. First, it, it, it would make exciting things possible analytically because with machine learning um, uh, tools and techniques and methodologies, it's now possible to take huge volumes of documents and effectively turn them into searchable data. Um, and given the way CRs are classified, there um, are all sorts of things hidden in the under, you know, particularly with respect to uh, gender abuse and racial abuse. Often the details are in the narrative and not in the way in which it's, it's coded at, at the sort of top level categories. So there's all sorts of, if we had more time, I'd describe, there's all sorts of fascinating research being done now sort of pushing the envelopes to what can be done analytically with machine learning. The second point, and I think this is really critical, is that this would be an extraordinary human rights archive. This collection of, of really testimonies. We talk about data all the time. With respect to the um, CPDP and the OIG's database, every data point is a human story. Every data point is a story told by a resident of Chicago who felt strongly enough that they had been victims of um, uh, problematic or abusive policing, that they were willing to see through a, a formal process of complaint. Imagine an alternative universe in which we had a, a city government that was committed to truth and reconciliation around these issues. And imagine that a commission was created and that um, thousands of people one by one came before this commission and gave testimony about their interactions with the police. That's what this repository is. This exists, this exists. Final point, and I think this is something that language sometimes fails us to, to describe, which is that, you know, that the term transparency is sort of antiseptic. It, it's a useful concept, it's descriptive, but what we're really talking about is the machinery by which government controls and manages information. And um, in order to, advance and reinforce and impose official narratives. Official narratives that as we know are, are often, um, and in some ways almost invariably at odds with the world as it is. And what, so what we're really talking about, and I think it's 
you know, important to, to use this kind of language clearly is lying. And one of the things that government can do, uh, you know, it's sort of against the nature of the beast because institutions impose themselves through narrative and will always fashion self-serving narratives. But one of the things government can do is commit to a proactive, robust, rigorous regime of transparency that ensures that information will be available to the public. And, and so, the, and, and I think it's also one of the things that government can do um, that has tremendous symbolic import and creates important public meanings. And I think the, the failure of our current um, administration to do this and to embrace the opportunity to do this is, um, you know, a source of so much of the of the distrust that that frustrates um, that frustrates all of us in trying to make a more just humane city. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jamie. Um, one thing you said, and we're going to come back to this, is the moral obligation to know about uh, uh, to know about the affronts to human dignity and, the, and to act on that knowledge. And so I'm going to kind of come back to that after the other speakers. Um, so next up, we have Joe. For this. So Jamie and I, thank you, Stacey. Jamie and I spend a lot of time talking over the years and um, uh, <clears throat> it sort of reached a point where um, um, we riff off of the same words, um, offer up concepts and framings, one picking up the other and so on and so forth to the point where we're sort of left with sort of consideration of what he and I have talked about um, as maybe having a podcast, um, uh, OGs sitting around talking. Um, uh, <laughs> but there's numerous things that Jamie said that I actually want to pick up on in the way of, of our um, um, life enriching dialogue for me. So um, the, um, the, this, this legislation that he talked about that is oh so close because there actually are no barriers to it, its implementation as a matter of cost. It's simply a matter of, of will. And those resisting are resisting the inevitable tide of history. <laughs> and it's remarkable that that tide of history is manifest and undeniable day by day by day, not merely in litigation, but in the way that the world works. And yet there is this sort of one remaining realm of, of resistance. But within those CR files um, is exactly as Jamie describes. They are, every data point is a story, he said. They're the narratives of the traditionally disempowered and victimized. And whether it's, whether it's in fact a found instance of victimization, or not, it is an important perspective on how, on the lived experience of millions of people in this country that ties to a narrative going back to its very foundation. And in there is the true power of narrative. And so to have these reports, Jamie talks about machine learning. What we're really talking about is the capacity to do searches that essentially codify do qualitative data analysis and um, uh, code specific terms and words and situations that then renders them susceptible to quantitative data uh, analysis as well and gets us into a different order of pattern review. Um, and, and so I'm 100% with him on that. The other thing that he spoke of significantly is transparency. And I gave a, I gave a, a I gave an endowed lecture 10 years ago at Lake Forest College, all around the, the, the concept of transparency. And I, I spoke in a hopeful moment, still relatively early in the Obama administration, but it, 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 there were words of warning and concern, even in that still comparatively hopeful moment. And that was, I saw the very term transparency being co-opted by those in power, the definition was basically in the hands of those in power. And so as we think about what true transparency is, and I, I actually, I, I sat, um, I was a panelist on a, 
um, a congressional, the, the Congressional Transparency Caucus held a hearing two days ago to which I was invited. And the transparency issue had to do with COVID and um, uh, Recovery Act money and um, our capacity to, to, to render it transparent and accountable, um, transparent to those who are supposed to be the recipients of it and accountable to everybody. Um, but the as I listened, we were talking about um, a top end data, top end information, and that is still largely where we sit. Um, but beyond that, if access to the data remains contingent, we are not there. If it requires formalistic asks, we are not there. If it requires litigation, we are not there. If that litigation impels the need for legislation, we are not there. And if it's not actively used by our legislatures engaged in meaningful oversight through the committee hearing process that brings the principles in to discuss what the data tell us, we are not there. And everything I just listed is the state of play. And so what part of the struggle here is a, it's, a, it's a sort of policy geek struggle, but part of the struggle here that needs to be borne in mind as we move from situation to situation is we are fighting for the definition and the soul of the meaning of transparency. And the significance, so let me sort of go to the some of the other remarks made. I am not used to walking into a gathering of lefties that the Nick Spasados of the city council call commies and to receive thanks and praise. Why? <laughs> because for, for my entire career, I've worked for the government and the mistrust of government is profound. And so the very recognition of the work that has been done by my office, an agency of government, to me bespeaks a recognition that ultimately government has to be part of the solution for us to move forward. And so the idea of um, uh, rendering obsolete and putting out of business, the Invisible Institute, very much was a positive statement. It was everything that is being uh, strived for there and in the work of Andy and in the work of other people here. That actually should be the first order work of government to make available in user-friendly accessible ways in a comprehensive ways, in comprehensive ways that allow civil society to do its work. I'm a lawyer, and so I'm going to go to a lawyerly place. Um, Federalist 10 sets out the importance um, and the need for checks and balances in our system of government. And we're, we're working with an antiquated constitution in many respects, but the concept of checks and balances is critically needed and certainly critically needed in this city where power is, power is exposed, is sort of, is, is reposed to an extraordinary degree in a single individual. Um, but Madison said that no matter how good a system of checks and balances, the system ultimate, the success of the system ultimately depended on civic virtue. Civic virtue defined as an engaged and informed citizenry. And without the information, the citizenry can't be informed. And if they're not informed, they eventually despair and disengage. And that is the battle that must be fought and why the definition of transparency is so important. There are approximately 32, 33 visualized data, um, uh, um, uh, tables, user-friendly, interactive on our website. The vast majority of them have to do with public safety, policing, the composition of the police force, the assignment and, and of the police force and, and the distribution across the city, um, uh, the activities of the police board, uh, the, the police department, 
uh, investigatory stop reports, which the, they get refreshed every day, tactical response reports, which are what is required um, every time force is used. And Jamie's colleagues at the Invisible Institute rightfully point out everything doesn't end up there, but a lot of things do end up there. And that is one of our lenses in, but that is there as well. Um, uh, 911 calls, um, arrest um, report data, um, all of these things, the core function of the Chicago Police Department, in addition to um, uh, uh, disciplinary history of officers, the impetus behind their creation was to turn us from arguing and fighting about access to data and information to putting that to the side, putting it in the hands of the people of civil society so that the argument shifts to the meaning of the data. And quite frankly, the data almost screams for itself what the meaning is. And then a meaningful discussion about what it is we're going to do about it. And the what it is that we're going to do takes all sorts of forms and it should take all sorts of forms across a broad spectrum of, 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 of outcomes whether it's abolition altogether, revolution, if you will, of sorts of what policing it is and how we go about it and the very notion of our need for it. But while that, that push is engaged, um, we have to simultaneously work on the evolution part because a lot of life is lived and a lot of terrible consequences occur from the system that operates and prevails right now um, visiting itself on those lives as they are lived. And so not only is it a matter of providing the information to shift on the spectrum where we have these discussions and arguments, it is also, and this circles back around to narrative, render the anecdotal because so often our discussions um, are tangents from an individual incident or even a small cluster of incidents that ultimately are individualized anecdotes. And for those that aren't dramatic to a degree that pierce the public consciousness, they are anecdotal in small ways that allow those in power to say, we're so sorry about your individual experience, but that is the exception, not the rule. What the data and access to the data allow is the transformation of the anecdotal to the programmatic and that changes accountability. So if transparency does not extend to the full scope of the programmatic in all of its dimensions and all layers of information, we are not yet there. The government, the IG's office, even in leaning into this, can't carry the baton beyond the authority that it has. But what it can do is it can close the space within which those in power are able to sidestep the anecdotal, are able to sidestep true accountability and force them to actually account for the programmatic. Databases are tools of human organizations. Andy spoke of the fact of the database, data, data um, institutionalizing racialized practices and history. Um, they actually are revealing of racialized practices and history. They are tools of racialized uh, and racist human organizations. They are also tools by which we not merely reveal the narrative of the lived experience of those who have been victimized, but they're actually tools for positive reform and change. Jamie speaks of, um, Jamie speaks of um, network analysis. That same network analysis can and should be used by police departments themselves as early warning systems for early intervention for, for officers with patterns of behavioral activity that is problematic before it becomes dramatic. All of these things that are revealing of the negative are also simultaneously opportunities for the positive. Unfortunately, and I'm sure we'll get to this and I'll close now because it's more important that everybody, everybody else um, be heard from and the audience has questions. 
our police department, this one, and law enforcement generally, but especially this police department, which who's, the reform of which is profoundly challenged by its bureaucratic and administrative mediocrity, is terrible with data. Every form of data that exists in the Chicago Police Department is not audited. The inputs are inadequate by people who aren't trained. Um, the, the, we all know the phrase garbage in, garbage out. And that's what we've got. The one thing that the Inspector General's office over the last five years has been able to do with access to the data is to clean the data, run it up against other forms of data that we have access to. The civil society simply can't and won't because there are sensitivities to aspects of the data, privacy rights, so on and so forth. But it can be used to improve the accuracy of the data. I am putting out a charge to everybody here to consider that all of the data that underlie those 30 some and ever growing um, dashboards on the in the inspector general, igchicago.org slash information portal, the data that underlie every single one of those is the best data, is the best data that government has and it constitutes the best data that civil society should have. And it is time to advocate for the disclosure of the underlying data, which the Inspector General's office cannot unilaterally engage in, but the government itself acknowledges, the police department acknowledges, the law department acknowledges, the mayor's office acknowledges, and so on and so forth. But this is actually the best, most clear, most reliable data. It is time to make that available to civil society as we as we even as we continue to build access to that data from within OIG. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joe. That was wonderful. There is so much to um, kind of sit with and to elaborate on, but let's do that after Matthew. Hello, Stacy, and um, good good evening. I guess at this point to everyone. Um, excited to be with you. I'm Matthew Sani. And as I was introduced, I'm the Chief Data and Technology Officer for the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Um, my job did not exist before I came in um, to it. Um, so um, it's been a fascinating four years for me. Um, I don't come from the world of prosecution. I'm not a lawyer, right? Um, I've been on um, mostly spending my time working in um, with political data at large scales often thinking about elections, but also movement politics, things of that nature. And so coming into the state's attorney's office um, really um, was a, both an overwhelming and um, exciting opportunity um, because um, the state's attorney Fox, um, she gave this charge um, immediately when I came in that within the next three months, she wanted to publish all of our case level data publicly to let everyone look at it at their own leisure. Um, and from that charge, we've been able to continue to build out, um, um, you know, more internal data products, external data products, better understanding of um, uh, what our office does, as well as how it's doing it and what the implications of that um, um, are. So kind of coming to this like root question of why we use data or how we use data kind of falls into a few um, large buckets of um, a category. Um, you know, Joe just talked about anecdote and then using data to elevate anecdote. There's another aspect that anecdote plays in the criminal justice system. So much of our um, laws and the way that we um, um, criminalize or uh, deal with these societal problems come from anecdote as well. This is um, clearly articulated in actually the names of laws that are named after Jessica and Casey and Jonathan um, throughout our country. So. The, one of the goals for us is to move away from the anecdote and look at all the information, or at least as much of it as we can. So when we're making decisions, we are factoring in everything, not just the thing that was atrocious and upset our, you know, upset ourselves, right? When we heard about it and made us feel uncomfortable, but we're really thinking about a holistic picture um, as we're making these decisions. So that's the first um, way we're really thinking about um, how to use data. The second um, is, um, you know, it's been talked about on, on um, this panel um, uh, prior, is to create transparency and to foster trust um, in that transparency. And, you know, 
State's Attorney Fox, when she was elected in 2016, were coming off of the Laquan McDonald tragedy, and actually not even the tragedy, the reveal of the tragedy, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, a huge um, um, schism of trust between the community and, and, and the government, and particularly law enforcement, exists. And it goes, you know, Chicago has a deep-rooted history that goes way before um, 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 La Laquan McDonald um, uh, of distrust and mistrust um, between the community and and, um, um, and law enforcement. And so with us publishing and providing this data, um, we are trying to at least allow people to have the opportunity to understand and examine it. What's interesting is that one of the things that is very true that we learned in publishing it was that people don't even understand how the system works as a whole, how cases can move through the system. You know, what's your first course court appearance, right? Is it my arraignment? Is it a preliminary hearing? Is it a grand jury? Is it a bond hearing? Like what, what happens first, right? And most of us, for, hopefully, fortunately, don't have to um, uh, be court involved um, in our lifetime. Um, so we'd never get a firsthand view of this. Um, so what we learned was not only did we have to publish data, but we actually had to publish a lot of materials around that data, explaining what that data is. There's an amazing flowchart on our website. And by amazing, I mean a dizzying um, flowchart on our website that shows where the cases can start and all the different ways they can you know, dump out, if you will, and how they go. Putting that together, right, like was a challenge internal for our office, right, because no one actually had sat down and, and been like, well, actually, how do cases move through our office, you know, what are all the outcomes, you know, how does this choose your own adventure get mapped out, right, um, and so, um, you know, that transparency is not just about what we're doing, but how things actually work in our office, right, that's a big part of it. Another um, uh, big aspect of um, our, um, our use of data, particularly publishing and, and making it available, is to actually encourage research. Um, you know, we have done um, um, what I think is a um, pretty aggressive um, level of publishing with a high level of fidelity, a lot of detail in there. We can't give everything, right? One of the things that um, I was very cautious of um, when we were publishing was um, the information I'm publishing is about people. And I do not wanna create a database where people can look up arrest records. I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm protecting everyone involved in these cases and I am just providing insight into it. So something that you know, matters a lot in you know, analysis, especially criminal justice analysis is like criminal history, right? We don't include criminal history on the data that we provide um, at this very granular level because it, it's so granular that if you knew a case from the papers, you could find that person in our data and then you could potentially link that um, case back to a person's criminal history that you might not have any insight into prior to that um, 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 effort by you. But we also don't want people not to think about criminal history and do research around criminal history and understand how criminal history or lack of criminal history is playing out through the criminal justice system. So we put out a lot of this data and then we created a pathway where more sensitive data could be provided to researchers, right? Academics, um, journalists that are into heavy journal, um, data journalism, um, you know, um, others from um, foundations and such um, that can access, you know, um, more sensitive, higher detailed data and then maintain protections around it as well, right? So that again, we don't de-identify anyone unnecessarily, um, that we don't um, you know, have a negative impact on someone that's being analyzed, if you will. The third um, way that we're using data within our office is to dispel myths, right? As much as the anecdote drives law, the anecdote also drives the conversation, the narrative, right? Um, you know, I've spent much of the last couple of years explaining that you know, bond reform is not causing gun violence um, in Chicago, that I can show data that shows that the people that are getting arrested for any gun case aren't out on bond or haven't had a previous case in over a year. So, you know, um, but until that analysis was done and until those charts were put together, those individuals that were, you know, um, driving these narratives because it was convenient for them to explain a very difficult problem. It is very difficult to arrest shooters they don't stick around after they shoot, right? Or if they do, something went wrong, right? Um, and so, you know, um, being able to um, dispel these myths and also, you know, 
quite frankly, protect progress that's being made in improving um, outcomes across the county um, has been a very big part of, of using this data. Um, and then finally, the big thing that um, we're doing is at this point is really trying to understand both what's happening and then what's happening as a result of what we're doing, right? Um, they're kind of two pieces of this puzzle, right? And, you know, looking at bond reform and people out on EM, if, are they committing crimes or not, right? We, we can look at that and see that, and that shows us like what's happening and what's happening as a result of um, uh, what we're doing. But it goes even beyond that, right? Um, we have seen massive um, increases in gun arrests um, in, um, in Chicago. And generally speaking, that um, sounds like a good thing, knowing what our gun violence um, um, uh, track record is, if you will. But when we start to really parse out these gun arrests, what we start seeing is there are kind of two kinds of gun arrests. A gun that was used in the act of committing a crime, what generally what we would consider violent, and then a gun arrest that the gun possession was the crime itself, right? Again, like they broke a law, so they definitely did something, but they weren't necessarily using it in any way other than possessing it in an improper way, right? And these range anything from I have a FOID card, but not a CCL, and I end up, you know, carrying my gun wrong, get pulled over, it's in my glove compartment or whatever, you know, all that good stuff, um, to I have a gun, it's unregistered, I don't have a FOID card, you know, to, you know, um, um, uh, end of the spectrum. And what we have seen in the recent years, right, is we were handling these cases, we treat them all, you know, there's all very serious cases, we, you know, um, treat them at the individual level um, in the appropriate way. But as we've seen gun cases um, increase, um, what we have found is that the violent gun cases, the gun cases that are being used in crimes are actually going down. And the gun cases that are not um, being used in crimes, that the crime itself is the possession of the gun is increasing. And from there, we can actually start to like splice and dice a little more. We can look at, okay, so how are these people arrested, right? Well, <laughs> the major driver <clears throat> of these gun cases where um, individuals um, were possessing a gun and, and ultimately charged, they were in a car driving and they got pulled over at some point. And so, you know, we've moved away from stop and frisk in any type of um, uh, targeted way. <clears throat> but social pressures, societal pressures, police wanting to police, if you will, and understandably so, like um, we've started to create a new bubble um, of individuals getting these gun charges. Beyond that, we've noticed that a lot of these individuals don't have any prior convictions that are um, I, um, getting these charges. You know, we don't necessarily know why everyone is doing the behavior that they're doing, right? But if I was living in a community where there was a lot of gun violence, right? I would definitely consider and figure out, right, how to protect myself. I'm not saying, I, you know, I don't own a gun right now. I'm not, you know, um, necessarily suggesting everyone walk around and arm themselves, but it's definitely a thought I would have, right? And it's something that like you have to consider um, um, for this population. So now that we see this growing population of individuals um, where um, we know that it's their, you know, it's gonna be their first um, felony if, um, if they get convicted, right? If they're proven guilty or they plead guilty. Um, what can we do about it, right? How can we think of programs that, you know, potentially provide services that don't end up with a conviction that, you know, take someone who was in a situation that made poor choices and we're all susceptible to poor choices. I promise you everyone on, on this panel and, you know, watching has made some poor choice in their life, maybe not as bad as possessing something um, illegal, but some poor choice. Um, and then um, get them, you know, to stop making that poor choice and maybe also like help um, support them and insulate them and provide opportunity for them or at least point them in the right direction um, um, so that they can get those things um, uh, to, to kind of change the direction. And it's been um, an interesting four year process to kind of get to this, um, this like pinnacle. Um, as Joe mentioned, um, a lot of the data that we started with uh, is very messy. It's gross. Um, you know, it is generally standardized, um, but um, there are sometimes things that are, you know, in comments fields, a lot of stuff in comments fields that you can't do much with. Um, so we've spent time grooming, understanding, testing it, validating it against other sets, making sure that at least directionally it, we're, we're correct. You know, we might be off by five if we're counting 50,000 things, but like directionally we're correct. Um, and, and then refining it. And then also integrating it across systems. 
our office um, um, has its own system, a uh, case management system that tracks our cases, allows us to add dispositions and such. But um, it doesn't really talk to any other systems um, um, that well. You know, we've worked with um, the city of Chicago and CPD to be able to ingest the arrest data and do more work with it, um, uh, you know, across the board analysis, understanding, you know, rap sheets and things of that nature, you know, giving us more fidelity. We've worked with the sheriff's office and um, the jail um, um, to, to end up ingesting data from them. So at any given moment, I can tell you everyone that's currently in custody and why they're in custody and all that good stuff. We've worked with the uh, clerk of the court's office to ingest data from, from them. They're recording a lot of the same data we're recording uh, separately, you know, so we want to uh, eventually implement some uh, efficiencies there so that, you know, at least we're not doing duplicate data entry, um, you know, um, things of that nature. Um, but all of that work um, takes time. It um, requires us to um, spend um, time looking at these data sets and sometimes asking ourselves, like, what is true? Right, um, you know, we will sometimes take hand counts um, from our prosecutors, look at the data in our database, look at the data in the clerk's um, database, and then see, oh, okay, we've got three different numbers. You know, which one, which one feels right? You know, or which one? You know, how do we um, get to the the right answer? Um, so it's a very tedious, um, arduous process, um, but it's something that we've been slowly working toward, and we're starting to get to a place. It's fairly excited, um, exciting, and, and gives us a level of nim um, nimbleness and agility that just hasn't um, um, hasn't historically um, uh, been possible. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I want to thank all of you. This is amazing. This was really interesting in terms of the ways in which, and the, the diverse ways in which I think each of you spoke about data and the utility of data. And one thing that I heard was this, almost the duality of data in terms of its use, use for a use in which, the way in which um, Andy and Janae are talking about the collection of data and the problems uh, that, that ensue with collecting a certain type of data. And, and um, both Joe and Jamie are talking about the, the solutions, using data to create solutions if indeed we can, um, create a level of transparency that allows, that also creates a level of, of access so that we can have this, you know, with this normative view of civil society in using data. Um, but we don't have a lot of time. I'm, I'm really curious because data is only as good as, even with machine learning, data is only as good as those who are writing the algorithm. Uh, or, or doing the coding for machine learning, right? So data into itself is not a good or an evil. It's who's, for what end, toward what end, who's creating that algorithm. And so I guess the broad question is really, what is your theory of change? Is it that we stop collecting or we collect more? Is it just that it's making it transparent? Because you can, we can both look at the same data and come up with very different understandings of even similar patterns or different analysis of what those patterns suggest because of what we bring to our understanding of, of, uh, of society. So what, what is your theory of change? And I'll start with Andy. Oh, Andy doesn't have his hand up. <laughs> so other people have their hand up. Uh, I will start, okay, so I'll go the other way. What is your theory of change? And we only have like a minute each. I'll start with Matthew and then Joe and then Jamie and then Andy and Janae, you guys have to clean it up. <laughs> I actually think, um, and, and it's, it's exciting to be on this panel because the other types of minds on here probably don't consider themselves super STEMI or maybe like, you know, um, whatnot. And um, data acumen across the whole population is going to continue to grow. And, you know, um, our um, end users, right, um, are going to be more sophisticated about what they're asking. You know, when I work with, you know, anyone from the state's attorney to anyone, uh, any prosecutor in the office, and they ask a question, right? I have to work with them to help them frame that question and actually like, you know, what date range do you want? And like, how do you want to define it? And like, start getting them a little bit sharper on, on what they're actually asking for. And then they get better at it. And then they can start actually like, you know, answering their own questions, seeing patterns and trends and, and growing um, in that sense. We can put the data out there. It's just, if you don't, if you're not, you know, groomed or or if you're not positioned to think about it, it it's not transparent it's it's gibberish um i guess i don't know joe let's go to you your theory of change the um uh the objective 
should be demystification. Demystification requires the lowering of barriers to entry. One of the barriers to entry, of course, is what we've all been talking about, the, 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 the poor quality of the data, um, uh, the lack of transparency around it. Um, but another aspect of barrier to entry is reflected by what has happened here in our conversation this evening. Different portions of aligned society, each doing things separately, mm -hmm. generating things separately. And what is needed to truly lower barriers to entry. And I would implore consideration of a proposal to philanthropy and not one branch of philanthropy, but a, an, an aggregation of philanthropy coming together because philanthropy in some part has funds all of this uh, to the extent that it exists, particularly in civil society, is that all of these forms of information, all of these tools come together in a single platform. You have to know where to go for what in the first instance. And we all live in silos and um, uh, uh, life today, unless you are in this geek wonk land yourself and interested in finding it, you're not gonna be able to find it all. You're, and so it's not interoperable. They don't communicate with each other. You can't get the bigger picture. And so we have to break down the compartmentalization, but data is here to stay. And so our job is to educate people and both, both at the technical level, but also with respect to easing their passage to it. Thank you. Amy. Yeah, so I, I heartily agree with both both remarks. I, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about internally at the Invisible Institute, which I think is also important to remember, is all knowledge is partial knowledge. You know, and one of the dangers with, with data is the notion that you've got your arms around a, a universe of data and you've, there's a kind of hubris that can, can come with that. And so I think that the it's almost, I mean, to Joe, I mean, I, I would add sort of build on Joe's point about having there be a, um, uh, a sort of aggregation of all sorts of, of, of data sources. But I think there's also this, this other dimension of understanding that there are things we, we, we can learn from a well-told narrative, a story, an individual story that can deepen our understanding of the world, of larger, of larger phenomena. I mean, we endlessly consume novels and narratives and movies and one, one sort of, you know, with an appetite for that, that kind of knowledge. There's things, there are things that can be learned from the data, from aggregate data, patterns that emerge, um, forms of analysis that are possible. There are other things that can only be learned in a direct neighborly relationship with our fellow residents of the city and on the ground, in conversation, in engagement with one another. And so I think there's a kind of a larger, to use a big word, epistemological um, theme here, which is how do we know important things about the world? And how do we learn them? And how can we get better at learning them? And how can we share that that information with one another. The, the one other thing I would add that goes to something that, that Matthew said about anecdote-driven law, you know, I think we that we have a lot of work to do in our in our public discourse to escape from the cogency of what I think of as the, you know, the Willie Horton rhetoric, the Willie Horton logic, which can take all sorts of forms. It can be an affirmative argument as well. But the idea that some compelling or appalling individual story can complete, I mean, Matthew's swimming upstream against that in the discourse about, about guns, right? You know, that some appalling story can completely trump and obliterate um, what can be known about the efficacy of a policy. So you know, one of the things that I've been advocating, I've been advocating it in a, what I think of as a kind of limited um, defund frame is we are capable of doing cost benefit analysis of all sorts of dimensions of policing, all sorts of interactions between citizens and police officers, 
are subject to an evidence-based analysis that can tell us whether this is worth doing, whether it's worth investing resources in. We're beginning to do that. I think the beginnings of the discourse around the shot spotter technology are kind of a beachhead for that. But there's, you know, there's, there's the possibility of doing that across the board. Stop and frisk under whatever name, stop traffic stops, you know, that have have sort of taken over that that function. Um, all the kind of quality of life policing that um, you know is associated with broken windows policing. There, there's just a whole range of interactions that take place every day that are, at least on hypothesis, counterproductive, alienating for citizens, and demonstrably run the risk of really catastrophic outcomes. And so there, there is this kind of, I think, paradigm shift available to us in how we talk about policing and reimagining policing and police reform. And it's driven by data, it's driven by evidence, but there also needs to be this understanding of, of what to do with the evidence, how to deploy it in our public discourse, in our debates with one another. Absolutely. I just want to just interject before I turn it to Andy. I think the point you just made in terms of the power of the narrative, the challenge, one of the challenges we face with that, whether it's the Willie Horton narrative or any other that are quite similar, is that the anti-Black narrative will be is easily consumed and understood and acted upon. It's far we we have wonderful narratives. That, that are not that, but they don't seem to resonate as easily, right? So there's always, you know, the, the richness of that um, unfortunately resonates too, too easily. Um, I don't know if Janae wants to go or Andy or you go tag team, but I'll turn it over to you guys. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add to what's, what's been said. Um, I, I really uh, agree with uh, a, a lot of the points made. Uh, except for just to simply say, you know, in answer to the uh, question that you posed, Stacey, about is is transparency just the goal, or should we stop collecting data? Like, what what is the theory of change? Uh, or at least from my vantage point, the goal of demystification and transparency is is the just the foundational first step. We we need that transparency in order to determine whether you know a set of data should be. Um, should not be collected anymore, or, or or whatever the case is, you know, with the, the gang database that uh, Andy and I talked about earlier, I mean, I love what Jamie said um, in, in his remarks that every data point is a story, because that's absolutely true. So when you're talking about, uh, you know, data transparency and, and, and collection is uh, labeling someone a gang member is the, what's the cost benefit analysis of that? And then when I talk about cost, I'm not necessarily talking about the money, but the human costs of sharing this data, sharing this label, this, this codified archetype with, you know, with landlords, with, you know, local and federal agencies, with, you know, agencies that can really impact someone's quality of life. Um, this is the difference between uh, uh, a traffic stop or a street stop um, and not, you know, this, this piece of data that's being collected. So, I mean, we, we can't determine whether uh, data collection is harmful to, to people and whether that the collection of that data is actually, um, the use of it outweighs the, the potential quality or deterioration of someone's life um, without the transparency of that data in the first place to, to evaluate patterns, et cetera. So, um, so yeah, I just my simple addition to, to all of the brilliance that's already been shared. Not simple at all, not simple at all. Thank you. Uh, Andy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and thanks for that, Janae. I thought that was, that was fantastic. Um, you know, I, I guess the two points that I wanted to just kind of speak to, you know, one, I really appreciated the way that, that Jamie spoke about kind of a knowledgeable citizenry, right? So that civil society can do its job and the importance of transparency in, in laying that foundation. And, you know, I think we're, from the work that we've been doing, the, the next step in that theory of change is, you know, is recognizing that the change comes from below from mobilizations by the grassroots and social movements pressing by people most impacted by this pressing for change right and so that's why you know our work is, has really prioritized that kind of you know partnerships with with social movements um, the other point that i want to make is is that, you know the big data the algorithms the social network analysis right that's, that's new but the racialized practices of policing aren't 
right? That's, that's not new, that's been around. And, and addressing the way that police use data to criminalize communities of color is, is a fundamentally important first step, but we can't stop there, right? And, and I think that that's one of the things that, you know, I find inspiration by, by, by so many movements in Chicago. Um, is it, you know, they, they, they're setting out to address these deeper issues of, of racial capitalism and anti-Blackness and dispossession and state violence. That, that, that are really at the root, right? And, and that, that framework, you know, that was kind of developed and put out by the Movement for Black Lives of divest and invest, divest from policing and invest in communities is, is so fundamental and so foundational, I think, for really getting at those deeper level issues. I'm sorry, me, uh, absolutely. Uh, Joe, you have your hand up again. Yeah, um, if, if I could just um, add, um, prompted really by Janae's remarks and then Andy's remarks. So look, um, this is an iterative enterprise. Every layer of understanding revealed by data should prompt a whole new set of questions and a whole new set of demands from civil society because those engaging the data don't necessarily have the lived experience. And that lived experience evolves over time. So this is an iterative enterprise. So the answer to so the answer to um, uh, part of your question really lay in Janae saying, well, we gotta we gotta learn all we can from what we have access to right now before we can figure out where it is that we can and should be going. And that is the essence of that. Second is I would say data is here to stay. Technology is here to stay. We must assume the technology will perpetrate the existing culture and narrative that exists, mm -hmm. right? And that really um, brings into play, I think fully, Jamie's observation of cost-benefit analysis, which is essential to really what we recommended with respect to ShotSpotter in our recent report, which showed that very, first of all, massive false positives, second off, very, very few actual response calls resulting in the recovery of evidence or arrests relating to violence or gun crimes. And that's a gigantic efficacy and a cost-benefit efficacy we should require with respect to all technologies first front end disclosure that it's going to be used and what it's going to be used for. And second, um, that we operate not from a trust but verify regime, but from a verify then trust regime, because that is where we are as a society and data helps us to do that. Um. Thank you, Joe. I think um, I had some mumblings before, but that's really what I, I was trying to get out. So thank you for saying that. Uh, we are at 6.30 on the dot. This was a wonderful uh, panel. And I want to thank you personally, but also thank you from IRPP, the Institute for Race Research on Race and Public Policy, for spending this hour and a half with us. We could spend, I'm sure, another hour um, talking about these. I have a list of questions I didn't get to. But hearing your stories, your analyses was was just absolutely wonderful. Um, so I think with that we say good night. <laughs>